Vim, you're getting my first question here, a, a two-parter, because I know this was a first pitch to you as a series of short films about public toilets. So I'm curious, what was your first reaction to that pitch, the thing you were most excited to explore? But then can you also tell me something you learned about public toilets in Japanese culture that wound up being a bigger influence on the film than you could have imagined at the start? Well, frankly, my first reaction was when I only read the first page of the letter, the invitation, I just read, coming to Tokyo, I'm, I can read quickly, coming to Tokyo, toilets, oh no. <laughs> Why would I go to look at toilets? But then I turned the page and I saw the toilets and I understood that it was an art project and a social project and realized that 15 great architects, and some of them I knew, Tadao Ando is a person, a good old friend of mine, and normally these guys build banks and museums, and now they built a toilet. And that is amazing in itself. And I thought, well, I should at least go and look at these toilets. If they ask me to do something and be inspired, what else do you want And being invited to go to Tokyo? <laughs> I love Tokyo. I hadn't been there for a long time, and it was still not possible to go there in 22 because it was still blocked for foreigners. And the people of Tokyo were, when the letter was written, still in lockdown. So when I came there in May 22, I checked out the toilets, and I was quite impressed. But I also saw the people, the Japanese people, the Tokyoites who came back finally after the longest lockdown in history. And that was, for me, the event. How they took possession of their city was so drastically different from anything I'd seen in Europe, where that comeback out of the lockdown was like there was no tomorrow. Cities were ruined after this. Parks were ruined. People had lost all sense of decency. I mean, public behavior. The parks where I live in Berlin were all garbage heaps. It seemed the big victim, at least in my part of the world, of the pandemic was the sense of the common good. In Japan, I saw the opposite. It was really endearing to see how respectful they treated their public places and also these toilets. And that's when I thought, as much as I like these toilets <coughs> and these architects, there is something bigger to do here. And as these people had invited me to be inspired, I told them the truth. And I thought I was probably talking myself out of a good job. And I said, I'm, I don't think I'm the man to do these short documentaries on the architects and their creations. I sense there is something much more important here after the pandemic and that there is something to be done right now in Japan about something that the world could learn from. And uh, to my amazement, they looked at me and said, can it be done? A real feature film? I said, yes, all we need is a good script and a great actor. And that was the beginning of a long friendship. Oh, I'm going to ask about that friendship. First, just to add to this, the beginning stages of this journey. So you decide you want to turn this idea into a feature film. And you know you want to make it about one main character. Was there any workshopping necessary to figure out the best main character to serve the version of this story you wanted to tell? No. <laughs> I knew the work of Koji Akusha. Actually, I have a very personal story. I knew all of his films. I knew Babel and Tampopo. I, I'd seen him in samurai movies and cop movies because from the beginning when I first saw him, I realized he was very, very special. And that first, if you want me to I'll tell you, as I'm a movie director, I got the job in the vendor's family to select the Christmas movie for the entire family. And that's a lot of people. This is old folks and young folks and middle-aged. 
And this is the de disastrous job, I tell you. You can only go wrong. It's either the young who don't like it or the old who don't like it. You never win. I want to give up on this job, but I'm stuck with it. The only time it ever worked gloriously was when I showed them, shall we dance? And that's when I discovered him, and I realized he has something that I've never seen again. His eyes are so effective, and he has such kindness in his look, and he's such a kind spirit. So when I was asked, who is your, which direct, which actor do you want? There was no two questions about it. And the next day they came back and said, we asked him, and he said, yes. If you want to make this film, if Wim Venice is going to make this film, he said, I'm going to be in it. You see? It's easy. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had to leave Tokyo again, and the screenwriter, or the guy who had invited me in the first place, he was a, he's a great Japanese writer also, and poet. And I said, and I'm going to write the movie with you. And he liked the idea. And I said, you just come with me to Berlin, because we can't write it here. I have to go back. I was on another movie. Is there any screenwriter in the room? Don't hesitate to be, tell me it was good. Oh, we got a couple. I have to tell you the truth. We wrote this thing in four weeks. Now, don't, don't hate me now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> good instincts. Surrounded yourself with the right people. I love it. Koji, for you now, very, very experienced actor. Can you tell me something about your process that stays the same from film to film, character to character, but then can you tell me something unique that this character demanded during the prep process? Uh, First of all, thank you very much for coming to the theater at a time when the Super Bowl is about to it start. Hasn't started. I really appreciate you all being here. It hasn't started. You, ha you, ha you haven't missed anything. First of all, Crank in my Scagurai, I know Hontoni Kono, Tokyo Toilet, to project no, say so in Toilet, no, say so in no, Katani, Scagangrai, say so no, Scata, or so at the say so in the Stoni, no, Shuzai, or Shinagara, eh, Cantonga, eh, Danish, no, Zutomatimasta. Uh, so first of all, I spent about two days cleaning toilets with one of the cleaners from the Tokyo Toilet Project, and I learned from them firsthand how to clean the toilets correctly, and I was waiting for uh, our director to arrive in Japan.遠くにいたんですけど僕はその時ベンダース監督と目が合ったと思って僕の友人に僕はベンダースと目が合ったんだよって言って自慢してたんですけどそれでまず最初に監督と会った時に東京国際映画祭で僕と目が合いましたよね
<laughs> as are we, because you are phenomenal in it. One of my favorite qualities of your performance in this movie is that... I was too shy to look into your direction. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite qualities of your performance in this movie is that you exude so much history of this characters without the movie needing to spell it all out. So it was making me wonder, did you do any backstory work yourself? And if so, is there anything in particular we could feel informing your performance, even though we don't see or hear about it in the film. まあ、普通はその、ま、この監督と高崎2人のその脚本が作り上げてくれた脚本はま、とてもその説明的なあの言葉が少ないか 少ない台本ですけども、とても美しい台本でした。でもその主人公とかその周りのそれそれぞれのキャラクターについてはあの過去とかそのバックグラウンドについてはあの書かれてもいませんでしたので、まあでもそういう場合は俳優は自分たちで
Vim, for you, what kind of direction and notes do you give Koji in order to take us on that emotional roller coaster? And Koji, for you, what are some acting techniques you use to hit all the different layers of that one single shot? Should I go first? I go first. Um, Nina Simon was, for the longest time, the cover page of the script. So we had a frontispiece, and it was the lyrics of Nina Simone, because I felt I look into the direction of you, because you volunteered to admit your screenwriter. I, it's always good to have some sort of word in front of the script that sort of s summarizes a little bit your intention. And everything was in these words by Nina Simone. So it was the frontispiece, and I loved it. And all the music in the movie was always on the set. We didn't make a movie where the music was added afterwards, but it was on the set. He knew the music that he played, and it makes a whole difference. And we felt, Takuma Takazaki and I, that the music was part of the storytelling and the songs. And as he doesn't speak much, the music would speak a bit for him. So eventually we decided that Nina Simone had been so important for us that it would, would be good if that was the outgoing song. and. We wanted to release Hirayama out of the film, going to work one more time, and but it had to be in a way that it was also an ending. So all I told him was, well, you understand the lyrics of Nina Simone very well. While you drive, you listen to them, and you also reflect on what was just happening in the last couple of days. I mean, the guy he met the night before who was dying, and he helped him overcome his pain, at least for a moment, and then he met his sister. All that, I said, is on your mind as you drive and listen to Nina Simone. And of course, you have doubts, maybe, about if you always did the right, if you did the right thing with your choice. But in the end, you're sure of yourself. So. And he was driving a car in real traffic. You have to know that. This is not an LA shoot. The, <laughs> the car was not on a trailer. He was driving the car, and he had the lives of four, four people in his hands. The cameraman on the seat next to him, the sound engineer in the back, the camera assistant, and just truly the director, with a monitor in his hands, sitting crammed in the back of this tiny little car. And, and so he drives, and he puts on the cassette. And then I look at the monitor. I'm to totally in awe what he's doing. I wasn't prepared to see him. And because it exceeded anything I had hoped for. And I looked at my cameraman, and I realized, oh, God, he's not looking through the viewfind anymore. He can't. He's weeping. Tears are streaming down his face. My cameraman is really unable to shoot. But he holds the camera and just holds it. He knows where it is. But he can't look through the viewfinder anymore because he was so affected. He was so close to him while he was listening to the song. That's all he was ever doing. He was listening to a song what his whole life was on his face. I don't know how he, this man does that. I don't know. I'm curious now what he's going to answer to your question. <laughs> <笑>いや、<笑><笑> だから
平山が怒ってるシーンだとおっしゃってでそれをやってみた後にもう監督ともう一人の脚本家にこんなに怒,怒る人なのかねというふうに聞いたら僕もびっくりしましたって脚本家も言ってましたけどもでもそれは本当に監督がその方法 M とかその微妙なその表情についてアドバイスしてくれたものがとてもこの平山という男が非常にこう親しみやすく身近にいる人間になったような感じがしましたちょっと長くなってしまいましたそれは本当に違うものだと思います私たちは本当に平山が笑っていたり笑っていたり You know, getting angry. And so I just thought this was a character that didn't really express、um, all that much. But、um, when, I, uh, when Hirayama was leaving for work, he would say, Okay, there's a moment where you kind of smile in this,、uh, in this time. Or, and he said that a few times. And then there's the moment where his co worker, the young guy,、um, quits. And、um, he said to me, Okay, when you call、uh, the office, this is when you're the most angry in the whole film. And、um, I asked Takuma, the co writer, you know, does he, does he really get angry? Does his character really get angry like this? And、um, myself and Takuma were both kind of surprised by that. But I realized after seeing the film that that advice is really what made him human and, and relatable. Well, I thought, I'm going to go to the camera. I'm going to go to the camera. お芝居をすることにとってもこう自由にやりなさいというような雰囲気が本当に僕はあの初めての経験でしたがね。And then I would say that、um, this director here really、um, told me to act freely、um, during this shoot and that was a really new experience for me.Act freely means much more because He so much became Hirayama that after a few days of always rehearsing and watching the rehearsal, and then said, No, we shoot it, and always having that feeling, Why didn't I shoot the rehearsal? It was so perfect. And, and he had become Hirayama so much that I almost felt we were doing a documentary on this character. He was so real, and it was, he was so much. This modest man of, who had reduced his means on, as his own choice and loved what he was doing and loved certain things that he was doing. So he was that character so much that even in the morning, my DOP and I, we left and we said, let's go see Hirayama. It, it was like we're going to see a real toilet cleaner. Where he lived and what he did. And so it was so liberating when he finally accepted, actually, he's never done this, I guess, in his life, that somebody asked him to shoot the rehearsal. And then when we shot the rehearsal, we were so happy that I didn't want another take. And that's how we basically shot all the scenes after the first couple of days till the end of the movie when he was alone. Of course, when there's other actors we had to rehearse. But when it was just his life, We treated it as if it was a documentary. And in a documentary, you will never rehearse. I mean, come on. You don't rehearse with your, act, with your people in a documentary. And we didn't, we forgot about the fact that he was fictional. Well, we didn't forget. We shot like it was a fiction. But we, we liked his character so much, and he was so completely that man that he allowed me to shoot the rehearsals. And, So he was more than acting freely, he became the film. And we basically had to, had to tell it in a language that would evaluate his everyday life and make his everyday life look as beautiful as I wanted it to look. I think most everyday routines of people in movies are not nice. And I wanted his everyday routine to be gorgeous. And I wanted you to want to live like this. So, what about you now? <laughs> Sorry, I went too far there. 
<laughs> it it does have that effect though because after watching the movie I might have gone out and gotten a new plant and planted that plant myself and guess what finally budded very recently and I credit I credit your movie with inspiring me to be better with plants I'm, I'm totally serious right now wow I'm grateful that you're telling me <laughs> What sort of plant is it? Oh, I, I'm not that advanced. Oh. All, all I know is that I, it, it's safe, and I'm going to treat it well. Don't overwater it. Yes. I've learned that the hard way. And there's an app, and you can take a picture, and then it says, tells you what it is. I guess we all know what I'm doing when I go home today, and it's not watching the Super Bowl. Um, now, as promised, I'm going to carve out a little time to squeeze in a couple of audience questions. So who wants to go for, oh wow, someone very enthusiastic back there. It's all you. I have a question for Mr. Benders and a question for uh, So uh, Mr. Benders, uh, how did you decide to choose the other songs that were in the movie? Uh, the Rolling Stones song, which was recorded in 1964, but never released until the 70s. And also the animals, uh, House of the Rising Sun, which you also had uh, Ishikawa Sayuri san sing uh, at the bar. So, how did you decide to choose the last Well, we figured in his biography that you do not know that when he decided to lead a different life, he didn't need much from his previous life. But he remembered the time in his life when he really loved music and when music meant a lot to him and never again afterwards. And that was when he was young, in the 70s. So he remembered that on the attic, he still had that old cassette recorder and this whole suitcase full of cassettes. And he got it down, and that was all he needed as music. And anyway, in his truck, he couldn't play any other. So when we had decided on that story, and when we wrote the first scene when he drives to work for the first time, it sounded sort of weak when we wrote. He sits in his car and he chooses a cassette and he plays a cassette. So I said to Takuma, come on. It's very important what he's playing here because it's going to make the whole difference. Let's write the song into the script. And we started doing this and realized the script that was a powerful tool to tell the story and to tell about his character. And eventually I, I turned to my co-writer and said, I, we can't do this. Sorry, but I cannot put all my favorite songs into the... F he, he is a Japanese character. Who knows what he was going to listen to in the 70s when he was young and in the maybe late 60s. So Takuma said, oh, he laughed and said, Vim, you, you don't have to worry a thing. We listen to exactly the same songs in Japan as you did in Germany or everybody in America. We all listen to the Velvet Underground and the Stones and Patti Smith. Don't worry. Just let's pick the songs that are right for the story. And that's what we did. And the, the animal song is interesting because when it's sung in his favorite bar by Mama-san, she writes the original text. She sings the original song. The original song, House of the Rising Sun, is about a fallen girl, a young woman who ends up in a brothel. And when the animals wanted to record that song, their management said, no, 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 this doesn't work. And they re and they retexted the song and made it about a young man and his blue jeans and his father and God knows what. And, but that is the cult song we all knew and all grew up with. And it became so much the beginning of the youth culture, that song. So we wrote all the songs with a certain purpose. And, and I hope. I answered your question. The Rolling Stones, yes, that is my favorite song by them, and they mistreated it and never really released it well. And it was the hardest negotiation to get cranked that out of them because they didn't want it. And finally, they gave in and said, "Okay, the film wants it so much. Let's have him. Let's ha have him give him driving through the sleepy city." Anyway, thank you for that question because this is such a. Oh no. 
、えー、めったにしないんですけどやろうかと思ったんですけどでもあのー、この映画にも出てきますけどもトイレットペーパーのあのー引き出し口のあれを三角に折りたたむことはよくやってます。Uh, the answer is not often,、uh, though I did think about it, and what I am good at is pulling out the toilet paper and folding it in that triangle. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, we shot this four times. Because it, it was never perfect enough. He wanted the, three tri- the two triangles to be exactly the same. We spent more time on the bloody little shot of the toilet bowl <laughs> than on the rest of the toilet. <laughs> If we do it now, it'd be perfect.、Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we can squeeze in one more question. Who wants it? I'm going to go to the first hand I saw right there. I had a, just a quick question from Peter Menders.、Uh, I had a really surreal experience of somehow seeing two of your movies in、okay. the last three months. Well, I shot a documentary over three years called Ansem and it was already opened in Los Angeles before. I don't know if anybody saw it. It's a documentary in 3D and took a long time. It took seven shoots. Thank you. It took seven shoots and took an eternity and went. And, and I got the invitation for Perfect Days before I was finished with a n s w e r So that's why I told I, my answer to, to the letter was please give me time. I can, I can come in May when my editor takes two weeks off. In the two weeks that my editor, after two and a half years of editing, she wanted a vacation. <laughs> Understandable, <laughs> in hindsight. <laughs> so <coughs> I used her, loca- her vacation to go to Tokyo and look at the toilets and find out what I wa- that I wanted to do something else. And then I told him I can only finally do the movie when, the other, when I have locked picture, and that was in October. <laughs> As soon as I locked picture and as the film Ansem went into post production, it was in 3D and complicated, and they knew exactly what they had to do for the next six weeks. I went to Tokyo and we shot this, this film in 16 days. So, and that's, and then, and because we sh- shot it so much following his routine, and the script was really based on his daily life, so the editing. Of this film, for some reason, was the fastest editing ever done. When the Japanese producers and my writer friend and everybody came to look at the rough cut, I said, I'm sorry, I can't show you the rough cut because we're finished. <laughs> so that was why both films all of a sudden were done at the same time. And that's how also both films ended up at the same Khan Film Festival. This one in competition where he won Best Actor. And the documentary was not in, competi- not in competition because as a documentary it can't, but it was official selection. The documentary took an eternity and the fiction went in no time. And it should be the other way around, I know that, but I remember next time. <laughs> We must.、Uh, Can I let just you point、go. out one person standing there? Oh, yeah. There's a tall blonde woman. And raise your hand so we know who we're talking about. This is Donata, my wife, and she did all the dream sequences in this film. Because. <laughs> shooting 16 days, we couldn't possibly do, lose one second on dream stuff. So, Donata, in, with her two women crew, she was one of them, shot and edited the, all the dreams and f- did all these marvelous shots of the Komorebi and of the, ref- of the reflections of the day in his dreams every night. We, we, have to, we have to let them go to another screening. They have a lot of promoting to do because. 
this movie received a very, very, very well-deserved Oscar nomination. So we want to spread the word, give Perfect Days all the support we can. Huge congratulations to you guys. And thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. Thank you. Thank you all for thank coming you, so much.